Hello and welcome once again to the program Road to State House. An ongoing program is a long way, of course, to State House, but we're trying as far as we can to get on board this program. All the political parties that are vying for that coveted prize to be in State House come next year after the polls of the presidential elections. Who will form the next government? The last time when I talked with the Honorable um, Mr. Dabo of the United Democratic Party, of course, like every other politician, you are thinking that you are going to be forming the next government. So quite a very delicate situation. To some of you, it may be a very long road to State House, but it's better to start now. We're talking about roughly by the time we start to see the campaign going on, something around between 16 and 17 political parties. Oh my God, that's just too much for this little country. But anyway, with me today in this program, Road to State House, I have with me one of the youngest politicians, uh, Papanjai uh, of the People's Progressive Party. Papanjai, welcome to Road to State House. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jones, and uh, it's a pleasure to be on your program, and I look, for, look forward to talking to you and discussing about uh, the plans of the PPP. I'm sure some of my viewers know you already. You contested in the mayoral elections uh, in the new dispensation, and uh, for those of you uh, who do not know my guest, uh, Papanjai, I would just like to know, uh, Papanjai, uh, who, who is Papanjai? Thank you very much. Um, I will just make it very brief. Uh, Papanjai um, was born in 1965 and, uh, in Banjul uh, to the parents of uh, Alaji Musanjai and um, Aja Asha Conte. And uh, I did my primary school life in Banjul, then uh, went to high school, St. Augustine High School, and uh, where I got my um, uh, all levels. Then uh, I had aggregate one in those days. That was a big thing, and uh, I was I specialized in um, uh, in the science field. Then I went and studied, uh, got uh, my master in agriculture economics. And the funny thing was that uh, the day I finished my last paper, the following day I came back home because I was so passionate about the Gambia and wanted to come back and uh, and do and, and give back to the society. And then I uh, was opportune enough to go and uh, uh, work with the Minister of Agriculture under the planning department. I was a principal planner. Uh, I went into the office as a senior planner, but within six months I was promoted to uh, principal planner because of uh, my innovative ways I had. Uh, I was able to implement in the in the Minister of uh, the Minister of uh, Agriculture under the, uh, the Minister of uh, the Planning Department. And I was responsible for all projects coming into the country through the ministry, responsible for making sure that the targets that they were setting, the objectives they were setting, were in line with uh, the government's objectives. And I was responsible also for reviewing those project documents, whether they were genuine or not. And uh, in the process, the same process also, I was responsible for monitoring and evaluating those projects, whether um, uh, the target that they set out to do were they implemented on if not what do we need, need need to do so that we get the output and i was there for a couple of years three four years then i moved uh, to the uh, national agriculture now for it's called now for is now. A, yes it was a, a project under the crs national women farmers association and there i had the opportunity to be exposed to the whole of gambia i worked with uh, women groups and we had over 1,070 kafus, and each kafu would have up to about 100, 100 women. And my job there was to really make sure that the productivity of the, uh, of the sesame was improved, and then to help organize the women so that they, they were able to sell those uh, sesame seeds at a higher price. When I went there, um, the sesame seeds, uh, they were selling it through the middlemen. And the middlemen were very, very uh, selfish, and they were like really extorting the women. So I decided to bring all the produce of the women annually, and then look for a market. And I was able to increase the uh, uh, value by up to 100%. And uh, whilst I was there also, I was able to add value to processing the sesame into oil and the groundwork cake. So 
the project there really helped me to be able to understand uh, the, rural, the rural women, uh, the women folk, what are the issues and uh, how marginalized they were. And um, that really helped me in uh, shaping my future um, um, work uh, career with other institutions. From there, I went and, uh, with Keba Turi and uh, Sakum Boj. We started the Gambia Investment Promotion and Free Zones Agency. Right. Let, me, let, me, let, me, let me put a stop to that for yeah. a time being. With that role that you played in agriculture, are you not surprised that still yet the Gambia cannot suffice it to say um, feed itself now and we rely heavily on importing what we eat? Uh, Mr. Jones, I think um, Gambia we can at least be self sufficient up to 60% of our needs. Uh, but if, if only. If only one, uh, we're disciplined. And discipline is one of the biggest problems. Two, if we plan, I mean, I'll give an example. We have seven regions in the Gambia, and each region has its, its uh, unique um, uh, qualities. You go to the uh, North Bank, they're good for, uh, good for uh, granular production, millet production. Why can't we concentrate our efforts in those sectors, in that region, and give scholarships and train people, young people, to say that, listen, if you are from this area and you want to go back to the land, these are the package. We, we, we take you to college, train you, give you the land and the incentives. And then you start producing. But in doing that also, the, import sub, the importation of those goods eventually should be either taxed higher so that those people are pro, pro, produce more and have a secure market. Not only that, government should give them a secure farm gate price. What I mean by that is that they will say, Every year, we would buy your granite or your millet at this amount. Okay? Then, as you go into production, you know that this is my farm gate price. And unfortunately, also, the reason that we are not really getting to the self sufficiency that we're all talking about, you bring, you write a project document. And in project document, you say you want to increase productivity by maybe 50% to grow rice and, and, and be able to um, uh, uh, grow 10 hectares of rice. Example, the, uh, the, ma the machinery is imported. The fertilizer is imported. The people who have the tech know-how are scared to go back to the land. So that's why I keep telling people that we as a country, we have to sit down and, and plan. Planning meaning that, okay, we say for the next five years, we want to, every year we want to grow 20 hectares of rice. How do you grow the rice? You need fertilizer. You need the tractors. But then that's not the only problem. We need people who can repair the tractors. We need people that will train a core group of people who are stationed, and that's their job, to repair, to even build tractors, to even build power tillers. We train people so that they become the marketers. Once you produce it, then somebody is, becomes a specialist in taking that, uh, those produce from the farm to the urban area. Or another group of people will be there to make sure that they add value. Once you grow the rice, then somebody should become a special in marketing it. You have to process it. You have to put it in bags. You have to market it. But this was supposed to be the role of the cooperatives. Yes. But, but did they, they fail? The cooperatives eventually, because it's a social good, the efficiency went down. We have to bring back that concept, but then give it back to the private sector. We have to have enough trained people on the ground so that they can do the job. Government should be biased towards those, those projects. What I mean by bias is that we work with the private sector, we get young people from Gambia College, train them, give them the incentives, make them produce, and they work with the private sector. And then we start get, getting those stuff from the farm gate to the urban areas. So that's why I mentioned that um, we need to have a national planning. We, um, the planning does not only stop at the at the at the at the technic, uh, technocr te technocrats level, mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. have to get the private sector. We have to get the um, the the urban planner. We have to get the sociologists. We have to get the agriculturists. We have to get the urban planner. We sit on a table. This is not our politics. These people sitting on the table. In the next ten years, where do you want to see Gambia? All right. Let me take you away from agriculture and your concerns. Maybe we'll come to that later on when I look at 
some of the take, some of the issues you think need to be addressed. Uh, away from agriculture, where else did you get involved to shape your, 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 your career and the person I'm talking to right now? I um, uh, spent about five years. Uh, we actually created, um, started the Gamba Investment Promotion and Free Zones Agency. And my was that under the NIB? No, no. Then the, it was a new, um, a new body okay. funded by the World Bank. Okay. It was called Gypsa, Gypsa. and now it has uh, transformed into um, Gaipa. And uh, I was the director of investment promotion and marketing. And my job was then was to sell Gambia to investors to come into the into the country. And that gave me an opportunity to know what international investors are looking for. They are looking for predictability. They're looking for stability. They're looking for a process that's clear and clean. They're looking for one, even if you say that you need to pay a million dollars, but that million dollars is transparent. They're looking for sectors that they can get profit from. No investor will want to come to a country when there's no profit in it. They're looking for that the investment is secure. Um, and I was able to bring a lot of investors um, despite that during that time the environment was not as conducive as we would have liked and I learned a lot of um, um, a lot of um, uh, international relation um, activities I learned a lot about how do we get those investors to come into the country how do we make sure that when they come into the country how do they contribute to the socio-economic development of the country uh, because I was in charge of um, um, appraising those projects when they, come, when, they, when, they, when they applied and they wanted to get the certificate investment certificate because the investment certificate gave them a, a tax-free incentive for five years and my job was to make sure that if we give them those um, five years in return what would the, Gambia, uh, the government or the government people get from it and we looked at uh, employment not only laborers we looked at skilled employment look we looked at uh, indirect taxes payment because when when they come they have to um, get a land they have to pay the, uh, the rates they have to pay electricity like, bill they have to employ people they have to transfer technology. We will assess those um, uh, 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 impacts and weigh against the benefit that they were getting. And um, if we felt that what they're bringing into the country was outweighed what we're giving them, then the, I will recommend for the certificates to be given. But unfortunately, even that process, there was so much corruption in it that um, uh, somebody from the, the state house will call you and say, okay, this is a project and I want you to um, uh, give them investment certificate. And I refused, I refused flatly, and um, I can go on record to say that I actually have some, I had some placard with some of the former regime whereby they insisted that I give a certificate. I said, no, I'm doing my job and I will continue to do my job. It was it's Gambia that made me come and get this uh, a position, a position. Eventually, I got fed up with it because um, it was becoming too political and uh, I resigned. But before then, I had um, uh, implemented a lot of projects there, and I'm proud to say that. Uh, even then, the way they were processing the documents and even appraising it, I created a system whereby it will take, instead of taking a month to appraise it, it took you like four days to do it because of the um, computer background expert that I had. So I left there, then I went into the private sector. I had an interaction with um, uh, CCBM, Serim Boop in Dakar. We created um, what is called Digital Planet. It was the first electronic uh, electronic a sales company whereby we sold um, electronic products not only did we sell we marketed mm. uh, then uh, one of our main competitors had a small office but we came opened a big showroom and uh, we did a lot of uh, a lot of sales and then we trained people not only selling but marketing marketing meaning that um, you go and look at a product and then see the added value on those products and sell those and sell those uh, added value and it was opportune during that time also to target students who've just finished high school, not my relatives. They were just there, they didn't have any hope. I brought them on board, trained them, and some of them become, uh, became sales managers. Some of them are still working as um, AC technicians, ed uh, electrical engineers. And Gambia, we needed people like us at that time to take people from the streets mm. who just finished uh, high school, who are according to the environment that you had to know somebody in government to be able to be able to get employed, took them took them on board, trained them for six months, and Alhamdulillah, most of them that now are in high positions and they're doing well. That experience I have. How do I interact with the young people? 
at one point you work with the U.S. Embassy. Yes, from there on, that's where I... And UNESCO. Yes. All right. <laughs> Very well. I, I, I have been keeping track. Uh, yes. Um, now, let us come... Up, uh, we will deal with some of these issues later on because I'm sure uh, with your work experience, you are seeing other sectors performing mm -hmm. and I'm sure you have issues or there is critic that you want to uh, put on those things in order to see that the Gambia benefits the Gambia that you want to see uh, is, is realized. Let's come to some little bit of politi political talk. Okay. Um, what, what, what inspired you? What gave rise to your desire to come into this? I don't know how to describe this politics. Poli politics. <laughs> yeah, which I, I really don't like. Yes. Um, I think everybody's a politician. Mm. You are either an active politician whereby you go belong to a party and then promote the agenda of the party, or you're a politician in a sense that you, are, you have a cause that you believe in and you work towards that cause. Mm. And if anybody knew Papanja or had followed me, if they've all, they would have known that from day one I, I, I was always an activist. I, I was always somebody who would see a problem and gather people to resolve it. Um, I did it when I was at the, when I was when I was a footballer. Um, I did it when I became the president of the basketball association. I did it when I was with the NAUFA. I mobilized women and looked at the problems. I did it uh, when I was even in the private sector. I did it more so when I was working with the American Embassy, whereby uh, during that time there were not a lot of uh, press freedom. Uh, people were not able to express themselves. I created the American Corners, and that's why young people will go get resources and they will be able to express themselves within those space because that space belongs to the American Embassy. And I created that and uh, at least over five to 10,000 uh, young people went through that. And I even brought in speakers who spoke about democracy, who spoke about uh, press freedom, who did a lot of things that were not directly uh, related to open politics, but it was shaping their minds, their mindset. And I'm glad to say that most of the young people now are scattered in all other political parties. And I was doing my politics in that way. But then came um, 20, 2016 when um, uh, we all needed to see a regime change. Um, we started becoming active. And uh, still then, my active, activeness was helping out, um, uh, encouraging people to go and get voters card, encouraging people to come to the, my, uh, my office at the Sabina Junction. Um, uh, given t-shirts um, uh, to sponsor some of the local government election uh, uh, candidates and um, I did it because I felt that it was time that uh, we, we got a change and that's where my passion for politic, uh, open politics started and then after the um, uh, presidential election I said okay now I've gone to government, I've done private sector, I've done the NGOs, I've done UNESCO so what is left in my, in my life that I needed to accomplish or affect a bigger um, number of people? And I decided, okay, the mayor election would be a good stepping stone for me to implement some of my ideas that I felt if I had the opportunity to implement them in KMC, KMC would be a better place. And um, that's why I contested. But uh, I came third um, within two months of, my, of me campaigning as an independent candidate. Uh, I was able to uh, mobilize a lot of people who came out and voted for me. And I keep telling people that an independent candidate doesn't have a base. Your job is more difficult than uh, an established party. Uh, I had to win the hearts and minds of people who belong to other political parties. And uh, Alhamdulillah, I really just want to uh, thank my supporters, the people that voted for me uh, until I came third. And uh, that was a stepping stone from uh, the mayor election. Then I sat down for six months. It was very quiet. I was analyzing all the political parties to see which one suited my agenda. But then I remembered uh, all throughout my campaign, the PPP, they were supporting me. They were part of me. And I had a discussion with them. Listen, I, I want to continue my political career. And uh, I would like to join the party. And uh, they said, the party belongs to you. It belongs to your family, your dad, and your brother and sister were all PPP. So you basically, you're just coming back to your home. And that's how I joined. And then um, it coincided mm. with, the, um, with the Congress. And uh, there was a circular asking people who were interested to put in their uh, the, 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 the name in the hat to, to lead the party. And that's how I uh, entered into the race. What 
legacy has the PPP left behind that you could tap into and become successful? I think in every, every political party, you know, uh, that's a, it's a life cycle. You grow, you mature, you expand, and then you decline. And uh, we are fortunate enough that PPP, we, we've completed the, uh, the whole cycle. And it's the only political party that had completed the whole cycle. And um, that is uh, uh, an advantage that I'm using. Uh, the constitution, we're looking at it now, how to uh, modernize it. Um, we have the structures. You cannot go into any household in Gambia without finding somebody who's a PPP member. It, it's not there. Okay. All the development that started, it started with PPP. A lot of people are talking about uh, why didn't um, the, the PPP government uh, establish a university. And I keep telling people that uh, development is a process. Mm. At the time of 1994, the plans were there. But then it happened, uh, the, president, uh, the former president, Jame, took over, took over and continued with the project. But at development, you're expected to come to a point, mm. someone else takes it from there and move it to the next level. When President Jame left, there were projects that were not completed. Now the current president has impl is implementing those projects. He himself eventually will go, somebody else continue to, to implement those projects. The University of Gambia consists of how many departments? The, 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 the education department, the Kwame College, was not started with the PPP. The, 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 the School of Public Health was not started with PPP. So all the branches within the uh, university. university are babies of PPP. But that doesn't matter. But because that is natural progression. What matters is that what lessons we've learned, what we did well and what we did not do well, we're working on it so that it becomes a better party. And we, we have our fault. We had our faults also, which um, I'm not shy to admit that uh, PPP also had, uh, we had our faults. Because when the president, um, uh, Jawara, um, wanted to resign, uh, some people, because of a selfish interest, decided not to, for him to not to resign. And that's where all the problems started. Okay? And um, we see history repeated itself a little bit in the Congress when we had uh, two, uh, two people, educated people, who I believe had the love of the party, contested. After the elections, I think the natural thing is for us to come together and move forward. But then, uh, because of different reasons that they felt, they moved out. But the genuine people, the genuine PPP stayed, and they're still with us. And um, we are working on the structures. The structures are getting stronger. Uh, but um, we do, we're changing the way we're doing politics. Uh, we're not doing politics of uh, suburbs. We're not doing politics of the big rallies. No. I'm coming to the, uh, I came to the PPP with a lot of connection to the young people. I came, um, I came to the PPP, uh, to PPP with a lot of integrity, a lot of track record that I've implemented the last 25 years, which I'm going to implement and use so that the PPP becomes the party that we were all once proud of. You're watching Road to State House. My guest is Papanjai of the People's Progressive Party. Like I said, it's a long way. Uh, it looks like they, all the political parties are running a marathon as they vie for the coveted prize of State House come 2021. You have someone I respect who's behind the uh, People's Progressive Party. I don't know how much you could tap into the vast experience of Omar Amadou Jallo. Um, he is, uh, fortunately, he's one of our advisors, and uh, he is also a, a, a member of the Central Committee. Um, Omar uh, Jal is just one of those many people who, uh, who has the vast experience, who are advising us on how to move forward. And um, you have, um, uh, I don't want to name uh, people, because some of them are actually um, within, um, within the government. And uh, some of them are uh, retired, but we're fortunate enough. We have a lot of people like uh, the, um, like uh, Honorable Omar Jallo, who are there to advise the party. So, like I said before, PPP is, is one of those few parties that have, been, like the, the one we've been there, done it, tasted it, and we could do it again. So they're there, and um, uh, we we're, we're glad because uh, Papa is more of a technician, he's more of a technocrat, uh, and I'm not a politician. Uh, uh, need the politician to 
be able to help me implement my ideas. And um, being a, politic a politician is not the only requirement that the, gov the country needs. The country needs somebody with integrity, somebody who has a vision. Okay? The vision. And leaders, we are supposed to be visionary. Uh, once we have the vision, we get our ministers to implement those visions. And then we should be strong enough when those visions are derailing, we should be able to have mechanism to, uh, to make sure that it comes back on track. Okay? And or if it derails for the, for the betterment of the nation, we accept it. So really, uh, that's the role of uh, Mr. Njai. Uh, I use my vast experience to guide and, uh, to guide and uh, make sure that the party is ready for the 2021 elections. Let us imagine you have put on your microscopic gas and the Gambia is under your scrutiny. Politically, what do you see? What mayhem do you see? <laughs> mayhem, yes. Mayhem. <laughs> I think um, no single party was gonna win the, uh, um, will, will form the majority. Mm. Um, there will be a lot of negotiations, a lot of discussions. Uh, there will be a lot of new voters who have never voted before. There will be a lot of people who are becoming more engaged in politi politically. Um, those people will be listening to you, listening to your agenda. They will listen. They will look at your vision. Uh, they will not look at you whether you are my friend, whether you are from the same tribe. That's a critical mass now. That's how they think. And the more we are able to be engaged as, as political leaders, the better they're able to form the, uh, the decisions. But then you have maybe 20% of the population, they'll vote on sentiments. They'll vote on because I belong to this party. They'll vote because um, uh, he's from the same tribe. They vote because uh, the guy has money and has given him a lot of money. But that the majority of people now are looking at the content of the person. And uh, I think the more we have debates, the more we are able to challenge our leaders, the better the, the voters will have a choice to, to decide. And next, next presidential election is going to be a very, very competitive, whereby people, uh, leaders will expect, are expected to talk about their programs, to talk about their um, uh, legacy, to talk about their integrity, to talk about uh, before politics, what have you done. I keep asking people that, um, that uh, I visit that, okay, the things that you need to ask any politician or even look at it, uh, any political leader, is that before politics, what have you done for your country? Before politics, what have you done for your neighborhood? Before politics, what have you done for your street? Before politics, what have you even done for your family? If the person has never done anything for, your na for his neighborhood, for his street, for his um, uh, constituency, or for his people, that person should not be relied on. Because politics is all about being a servant. It's about having a vision and working for those people. It's not about you enriching yourself. So that mentality is what uh, the PPP is going around talking to people, young people for that matter, that uh, open your eyes. It's not the rasmatas, it's not the, um, the hula boo, it's not the, uh, the, the noise that you should, you should listen to. Listen and look at the integrated person and look at um, what he has to offer to the government. And based on that, you make your choice. And I don't tell them to vote for me, no or even come, become a, a member of the PPP. No, my role as a member of the PPP, as a Gambian, is to educate people so that they know and understand what are their rights. And when making decisions, these are the criteria that you need to look at. I, do, I mean, if I'm, if I'm supposed to be lead, I will. But what I have control is the information that I have inside me, the experience I have inside me, that I want to share with people. And that is my motto. People, the women, the youth, the environment, and, the, and our assets. How do we better them? I want to bring your attention now to certain issues affecting this country and ask what is your take on those issues. Now, for example, uh, we're in a very uh, trying, we're in trying times now with COVID-19 almost ravaging um, almost every sector, stringent measures are being taken, people are being given advice to stay at home, uh, people are asked for social distancing and stuff like that. Economically, 
how do you see this country uh, performing prior to COVID-19, within COVID-19, and post-COVID-19? Um, thank you very much. Globally, we're already in a recession. And uh, that's a saying when America um, uh, coughs, when it sneezes, sneezes the whole world the coughs. Whole coughs. Yes. And um, they already uh, started talking about the recession. Sometimes I like to see the, the cup half full than half empty. Mm. I think out of every emergency, there are opportunities that is created. Mm. Opportunity, one of the opportunities that we create, that we're seeing now is, we all know that the health system is weak. Mm. We all know that primary health care is something that government must invest in. We all are beginning to understand that import substitution, growing our own food stuff, it's important. We all know that Gambia is such a small country that if something comes, um, if there's an outbreak, the likelihood of affecting the whole um, uh, society is great. It's, it's, very, it's very catastrophic. We also not find out that we don't have information data. If there's a state of emergency, the first thing you need to do is to have the data of the population number of women who are below the age of 18, uh, the strata, uh, how many people are in the rural areas, how many people live in Ibotan that are really unemployed. That information is important. And I hope moving forward will change the way we collect data. Without data, we cannot do anything. The other thing is that we, we learning from this um, situation is that the Disaster Management um, Authority, or whatever you call it, need to be uh, looked at again. Because if that's a state of imagine, imagine within a week or two weeks, we should have started going out, talking to people, coordinating. By the time that the, 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 the COVID-19 uh, COVID started spreading, and the time we took to re uh, react was too slow. Until we start getting in, um, some in, um, some infection, that's when we decided to to react to react. So we learned also that with st in state of emergency, we don't we don't uh, we, we should be we should not be, be reactionary. We should be proactive. We should have an emergency system whereby immediately we have a problem, we get up and go. They say that they have uh, um, uh, a coordinating committee, which comprises of government officials and uh, some of the line ministries and some of the donor partners. That's not enough. Get the civil society in it. Get the um, heads, of, um, he heads of villages in it. Get people who are the private sector in it. Let's have one coordinating um, body. Now, I just want to thank the private sector and the governments for going out and helping and uh, feeding the need. But it should have been a coordinated effort, whereby we will start from Banjul, we have a committee there that will have had the data of people in Bandit. Number of people who are employed, I guess number of people who are un un unemployed. Okay, number of a number of uh, foreign, uh, foreign nationals who stay in Bandit. Then we start distributing based on that. Because if you have a correct data, you will know that number of people who are, who are earning some good salary. You will know that number of people who are, are laborers, number of number of people who are unemployed, and the size of the family then you can implement the programs. And it's very unfortunate also, I was looking at the budget uh, for the f of 500 million dollars uh, budget that we're talking about, and I've seen nowhere mention of food. How do, you, how do you feed the people? I keep asking people that this 500 million and the money we're getting, is it for two things? We need to find out. Is it to rehabilitate the, the weak healthcare system or is it to fight and help prevent the COVID-19 and also help the economically, economically disadvantaged people during these three, four months and the business that, have, that, that it has affected. We have to decide as a nation. If it's just we really want to uh, rehabilitate. And that has not been done. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think now the sense I'm getting now is it's more about trying to rehabilitate the, the, the failing private healthcare system. If that's the statement, then we'll come out and talk about it. So really, the money we're going to use, we're going to use it to rehabilitate our, uh, our weak private health system. 
or no, this money is for the COVID-19 sensitization so that we have a lot of villages along the borders who don't even understand COVID-19. They think it's not a reality. So what do we do? I hear that we want to buy a lot of cars, a lot of new pickups. That's not the issue. Government has enough cars. This is an emergency. All public vehicles should be recalled. And we use those vehicles to go and sensitize every single village in the country. And how do we do that? We do it through the VDC. But even the VDC, VDC they don't have data on, on, on their villages. So like I said, out of every, every um, uh, challenge, that's an opportunity. Um, I'm hoping that go, moving forward now, we'll see the importance of data. And I was fortunate you know, when I worked at the American Embassy, they collected data. The, the, uh, the, the US, US system is one of the, uh, one of the countries that collect, collect most data. Without data, we cannot plan. Without data, we will not be able to forecast. Without data, we will not know how many, how many, how many schools do we even build. Because we don't know the number of um, kids have been born every year. And how, when do they reach the age of going to primary school? Okay? We do not know how many nursery schools are in the country. Whether the ratio to nursery school uh, teachers and, and people are enough. So data, data, data. I know a lot of people are saying that I'm hungry, I don't care for data. But it's, what, it's, it's using that data to better plan for a better Gambia. Poverty is a serious problem in this country. And uh, it has created uh, non-compliance mm -hmm. within the uh, 45 uh, days period of the uh, public state of emergency. People cannot stay at home without having something to bite. They must go out. Yeah. What did you take? Um, two sides to the coin. I feel very, very sad in that people cannot go out and, um, and get the food. That's why my initial uh, statement was, what is the purpose of the money collected? Is it to rehabilitate the failing healthcare system? Or is it to rehab, to, to save those people who are affected by COVID-19? If it's that, if it's because of they want to re, uh, save the people, then we would have already gotten a system whereby we start giving um, 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 food assistance to those people. Okay, we should also look at possibilities of whereby uh, those people affect, affected uh, directly or indirectly. How do you compensate them? I've seen other countries whereby the president made a, pro a proclamation that uh, for the next three months nobody should pay, pay electricity bill, nobody should pay um, uh, a water, and then uh, there will be a soft loan for any or all businessmen who can go and take the soft loan, and they'll have a one-year grace period, and then after they start paying. All these are incentives. But Gamba, the, our economy is so fragile that we need to get the expert to sit. Mm -hmm. And each country is so different. Even if we, if, it's, if we say that some people, about 40% of the population, they don't have access to electricity. So will that affect them? No. So we have to come up with a uniquely unique um, uh, um, uh, programs whereby we, have, we help the, young pe uh, the, the uh, poor people. But then to flip it on the other side. Yes, you're, you don't have means to, to eat, you're, you're, you're suffering, you're tired, and you're hungry. What happens if you get that disease? Would you be thinking about food? You will not. You want to be cured. You want to be cured. cured. Mm -hmm. So that's why, I say, that's why I'm saying there's two sides of the coin. Yes, people have to stay indoors. But if they stay indoors, what are the mechanisms to feed those people? In other countries, what I see is that they have, they have food banks where people will go and take that ration every day. But how would you do that when you don't have proper data system? If there was a proper data system, anybody going to the food bank, you bring your card, to swap it, it registers. You go to another prison and want to do it, you are already registered, you will not be able to do it. That same card will tell you number of people in your household. So data, data, data. Discipline, discipline, discipline. If we're not disciplined, we'll get corrupt easily. If not disciplined, you don't go to work on time. If you're not disciplined, you will look for um, uh, you will look for per diems that you're not supposed to get. If you're not disciplined, like what happened with the, uh, with, the with recently with the the, uh, the allowances that we're talking about. If you're not disciplined, you include, you include your name there. Where is your name not supposed to be there? If you're not if you not if we're not disciplined as a nation, we will every single institution will have their own per diem rates. No, it should be there. 
that government for the embrace are fixed. When there's an emergency, this is how it is done. And when it's a, it's a, uh, uh, um, a donor fund and money coming in, it doesn't matter. This is the fixed per diem that you pay. We do not need all, all these extra vehicles. Like I said, let's get all, record all government vehicles. And the former government used to do that. When the, when the pres president Yama used to go on track, he called all vehicles. At, at, at one time also, I think the uh, current sitting president did it. Let um, all the vehicles come back, even that, that, that of the ministers. And this is the time of national... Yes. Uh, you know, we have a national emergency. Yeah, these, the ministers, even the ministers, mm. let them stay with one vehicle. The next vehicle, the other vehicle, they go back. And we use those vehicles because those are public assets. In this, in this plane, if you're a minister and you know that that's a public a, a crisis, mm -hmm. if you're disciplined, you will tell, okay, listen, let all my vehicles go back to, 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 the, the, to the coordination center and we work from there. So indiscipline is one of the cancers that is eating Africa. You keep um, uh, blaming the policeman who gets about $3,000 salary that he's corrupt at the traffic light. Not forgetting that policeman has a family to feed. He buys a bag of rice, $1,500. He's, he, he, he's left $1,500. And then he wants to pay the rent. He wants, to feed, he, wants to, uh, he wants to buy, buy cash for He wants to feed his family. No. Mm -mm. That guy will be corrupt. Absolutely. One of the mechanisms that government need to do then, anybody who's a civil servant, not only are we going to give you a property, will bill it. I mean, that's what they do. Bill it, give it to you. You, mm -hmm. pay, gra you pay gradually. Don't give you a, go a, go a civil servant a, a property, a land. Mm -hmm. He cannot bill it. He doesn't have the salary to bill it. But get government to build public housing, Give it to civil servants. Give it to the disabled. Give it to the people who are really, really poor and they can afford it. People who are living along the Ibo Tan, the river, uh, the river Gambia here. It's because of poverty. In this place, is, there's, there's so much indiscipline. The physical planning people, the urban planners, should not even, I even allow people to, to, to live along this river. And how do you create indiscipline? We start from a nursery school. We teach them discipline. We teach them what is national anthem. We teach them what is the, uh, uh, the constitution. Last, just be, be during the, um, the uh, inter-school uh, competition, I was at the stadium. And I've repeated this somewhere else. Uh, I sat in my car waiting for some people to come. And then this PE teacher, or the teacher, was supposed to give out, I don't know, food or certificate. And he was standing him, and people, all these people around him shouting, teacher, 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 teacher. That is the problem. That is the problem. That is the problem. As a teacher, you tell them, queue. Don't queue, I punish you. But if we do not regulate that environment, we teach them discipline. That's we teach them, it was, it yes, was we way. teach them, it's gambling before your tribe. Mm -hmm. yes. Know your tribe, be proud of your tribe, but gambling force. Let me draw your attention to, uh, you mentioned corruption. What breeds corruption in the Gambia? Indiscipline. Indiscipline. Nepotism. Putting the wrong people in, in, uh, putting the wrong people in the wrong places. If I'm the Minister of Agriculture, I bring, I bring in my, uh, my cousin, my, 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 my young cousin, to be the, uh, the procurement officer. He's not, he doesn't have the right qualifications. Of course he's going to suck up to me, because he wouldn't want me to uh, fire him. Because I'm indisciplined also, I'm corrupt, I'll also put him there so that he can do my corrupt practices. So, it's a cancer that we have to re-educate ourselves. We have to put the right people in the right places. Mm -hmm. We have to separate personal interests with government interests. We have to reprogram everybody to say that Gambia first. And that, what, one thing I've noticed uh, when I was at the American Embassy, Every position that you need to be promoted on, there are a series of classes that you need to do. If you do not get those classes, you will not, they will never promote you. Mm -hmm. And there are online programs. One on ethics, corruption, financial practices, the, uh, the, 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 the op operational manual of, that, uh, of the American numbers. You need to pass it. And we have the FI here. 
We have the general orders. How many people have, have heard of the general order and the FI? Some have not even seen it before. So, it's, it's going to be a generational problem. And it will not change overnight. But we start. We start by the, just sorry, sorry. We start by his, um, uh, the president going to meet him sometime. Mm. Giving expectation, uh, deliverables that I need this delivered in, in, in by X amount of days. Mm. And those ministers also go to meet him sometime. Give deliverable, de deliverables and then att attach it to performance. And then it goes down. And then when they deal with the private sector, they f that those same formula will, uh, will be implemented. So eventually, we'll see a transformed nation. But people also need to be paid properly so that they will be scared to be corrupt because if not, they will lose their job. I have seen some very, very glaring and disturbing um, scenarios emanating from our civil service. Mm -hmm. Documents being leaked from the civil service to uh, social media or to some sources that I don't want to say. I have seen um, civil servants making glaring mistakes. Recently, the vice president tabled uh, the motion to appoint the ombudsman, mm -hmm. and they failed woefully in a situation wherein they shouldn't have failed. The vice president shouldn't have gone to the National Assembly to announce or to put in motion the president's nomination for the second time. When the president nominates, I'm sure you're aware, mm -hmm. when the president nominates an ombudsman, if he, that person is disqualified or if is rejected, the second one should not be rejected by the National Assembly. But then, <laughs> here we have <laughs> a situation where it wasn't the fault of the vice president. Mm -hmm. Some technician at the office of the vice president blundered because that person did not synergize mm -hmm. with other sectors that are, uh, that are part and parcel of, of, of that of that of that of that that, that piece of uh, legislation and it was very embarrassing for the vice president to fall victim of that I think um, what we really need to do is uh, look at the civil service again um, let me just talk on the um, uh, the leaked information uh, situation situation I think people need to separate um, uh, politics with the civil service that's why in the former regime, or what, the First Republic, uh, the civil service was a very efficient um, uh, system whereby they tried as much as possible to stay away from politics. They were there for the civil servant. They were there for the, uh, uh, for the public. And they served the public, not the sitting president. Uh, the sitting president was served by the ministers, but the civil service was there for the people. And um, Code of Ethics, when it were instilled in uh, in everybody's mind, and um, people became proud. People were proud to be civil servants, and uh, the employment, the way people were recruited, was through a process. You can it, it can never be a governor or a permanent secretary without serving so many so so many so, 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 or most of the other regions. You had to go through a process, and that was the process that would groom you, comb you, teach you, so that you become a a, a proper a professional civil servant. But you see somebody who doesn't have any civil service background uh, gets up and become a, a permanent secretary and, or becomes a director of, 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 an of institution. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work like that. We have to look at the civil service. We have to remove politics from it. Okay? We have to make sure that, I mean, in other systems, mm -hmm. like um, every letter has a level of security. Mm -hmm. It goes beyond that security. If it goes to the next level of security and then it leaks, we will know likelihood the number of people who have gotten in contact with that information and how it got leaked. It's easy. If a letter is emanating from the from the clerk, okay, that's a that's a system, a coding system, a security system that will code codify it. So if if you if you leave this um uh, the 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 the, office, the the secretariat, it goes to the next next level, maybe to the DPS. That's a coding system within. Whereby you will know that it emanated from the DPS's office. That letter, if it leaks from the DPS office, then you will know that it's somebody within the DPS. Then you hold the DPS accountable. But those checks and balances will come gradually. Those checks and balances will come when the civil servant know that they're working for the people, not for the for any political party. 
will that ever happen? It will. It, ha it happened before in the in the in the, in the, in the Jawa region. And it will happen again. I'm someone who's very positive. I like to... Like People are very inclined to party politics right now. Yes, but this 65% of the young people that are coming up, uh, a little bit of them, but more and more of them are becoming nationalist. And... Uh, Gambia first. Gambia first. And uh, change don't come easy. It doesn't come overnight. We take the small steps, a lot of many small steps. And once we bring them together, we will start to see the uh, change. And the change starts from the leadership. The change starts from the head of director at the at a, at a particular in, an institution. Change starts from making sure that the employment, the recruitment is transparent. Making sure that the pe people are tied to their performances. Making sure that that's a system of remuneration and reward. That's a system of penalizing when you don't meet your targets. That's a system whereby if somebody falters, that's a, that's a dismissal process. First warning, second warning, bringing that, bringing that person to the office and discussing, hey, listen, what's happening? This is what, what you've done. What As we wind down towards the end of this program, let us look at unemployment. Um, last time round, the president of the Republic of the Gambia um, presided over the graduation of university uh, students, about a thousand plus. I said to myself, oh my God, <laughs> where, where, is, where are these folks? these young Gambians now matured in whatever discipline they were studying and eager to you know to just grab a piece of the of the of, of, of job to be able to you know build their career where where Oof. again um, in my previous discussion I talk about uh, national planning the we have to look at the education system again it should be transformative um, one, we have to, as a country, decide wh what's our direction. If we think that uh, value adding and um, or even Gambia become a, a commercial center, uh, a financial center, or we want to promote sports, uh, or we want to promote more of agriculture, we restructure our education system so that with the proper data, we'll know that every year, we, number of people are coming out graduating with their BSc or their masters in agriculture. We know there's a number of people who are who are in the population people who want to go to uh, uh, who want to get that education. Then we say, okay, we want. I, I talk about agriculture because I'm very passionate about it. Uh, we want we we expect to have ten projects coming in in the next five years, and those ten projects uh, we want um, uh, uh, we will know the number of economists we, we need, number of um, um, civil engineers we need, number of um, uh, um, uh, farm mechanics we need, number number of Procurement, a no, uh, number of procurement uh, special need, number of people who want to go back to the farm. Mm. Once we reprogram our education system based on our national needs, we sit back and say, okay, now government starts, is going to give scholarships to students from grade 12. You are from we are from CRR. We know that CRR the go at all right there. If you want, we we'll give you a scholarship to go and store agronomy, or we'll give you a, 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 a scholarship a group of people that maybe we need 10 agronomists in the next five years. We will, we will give a scholarship for you to go and store irrigation systems. Or we'll give, a scholar, we'll give 20 people scholarship or 100 school people scholarship bridge to go and store livestock production. We'll give somebody to go and store marketing of the farm produce. Okay? We, go, we, st we give uh, people to say, okay, you go and study urban planning, rural planning. So if we target education system based on that, then as they come out, they already at least forty percent of those. The brightest will start getting. Will already get have their where they're gonna go to. The rest we engage the private sector. Government's job is to create an enabling environment for people to have jobs. Government should not be the number one employer. The private sector should be the biggest employer. And how do we do that? Is to work with the private sector is to work with the private sector with our vision. We want Gambia to, we want import substitution, we want 80% um, of, uh, of the importation of, uh, of basic commodities to be produced locally. That's a big statement. Mm. Then you go and talk to the private sector. Then you talk to the Minister of Agriculture. So, okay, these are the number of people we need, and this, this is how we're going to do it in the next five years. I've seen, when I was uh, at the, uh, with government, you create a project. And in the project, 
you have people to train. Mm. And those people you, you train supposed to come and implement the project. But no, the project will start, those people that you're supposed to train will, will go for that training three, three years down the line. When they come back, the project would have finished. What's the impact? None. Even the people that are supposed to select to go on that training, they go and choose their, 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 their relatives. They come back, that's a mismatch. They'll come back towards the end of the project. They leave. The project fails. Because the, 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 the inputs that we need to make that project work is not there. The inputs that we, the, the, most of the money would have gone to um, recurrent expenses. Here I'm talking allowance, vehicles, uh, workshops, uh, studies. And we're tired of studies. We're tired of, we're tired of workshops. We have to be action oriented. So the planning, the data, the civic education, uh, tying projects to the real targets, in, involvement of the uh, of the private sector, involvement of the uh, of the of the educational system, based on where we want to see ourselves. PPP, PPP it was founded by the rural people, and we're very much passionate about agriculture. We're passionate about uh, productive, um, adding value to the productive productive base. We are very passionate about uh, import substitution. We are very passionate about education. We are very passionate about universal access to primary health care, uh, primary health care, um, basic education for everybody. As you, as you mentioned PPP, let us wind down on that and uh, come to the end of this program. Um, shall I ask you, or I would like to ask you right now, um, how does the PPP think it can muscle up and be competitive come 2021? Um, we are competitive. Um, I know the PPP alone, PPP alone cannot uh, form the new government. Uh, um, we are strategically working to make sure that uh, when come 2021, we will be in a position to determine to work uh, political parties that we can work together to form the next government. Um, PP, like I said, uh, PPP, we are very uh, rural, uh, rural focused. Uh, PPP um, it will not go to any household in Gambia without having a PPP member there. Um, as a leader, you have the vision. As a leader, you also have a base. And uh, my base is really among the young people. My base is in KMC. My base is in rural areas. My base is everywhere because I talk the language that they understand and I have my integrity, I have my track record to back uh, all the ideas that I have and um, we're very passionate about women. I'll give you a study that says that if women had the same access to input, to fertilizer, to land as men, the productivity will go up by 20 percent. That's an, that, that's a, I think that's a FAO study in 2021. Uh, Papanjai, flag bearer, shall I say flag bearer? Of the Inshallah. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, Papanjai, thank you very much for being my guest. It's a long way, like I said, to 2021, but nothing is long enough. Um, there's much to be done. Finally, what do you think about 17 parties? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's really it crazy. Is. I mean, I think... If you really believe in Gambia and want to work with Gambia, why not join some of the more established parties and, change, and do change from within? I mean, that's what I did. I went to a political party and started my change from within. 17 political parties, that's nonsense. I said, but it's democracy also. Everybody has the right to, 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 uh, uh, to, to choose and form a political party. But on a final note, I just want to say that we all want to go to Banjul. Banjul being in the object is developing in Gambia. And we, are, we all have different routes to go to Banjul. That's the vision of promoting Gambia. And as we do that, let's be civil. Uh, because at, at the end of the day, we all are one, one big family. I keep telling people that um, politics is like, a, uh, it's like your garment that you wear. In the morning, you wake up, wear it, go and do your politics. In the evening, take it off and be a Gambian. And work with Gambian. And be Gambia force. Thank you very much, my brother. Thank you very much, Papa Jai, for being with us on Road to State House. It's been a pleasure absolutely to talk to you. Thank you, my brother. That was Papanjai, the flag bearer for the People's Progressive Party. He was my guest on Road to State House. For me, Malik Jones, bye-bye till some other time.
Thank you. Let's do the greeting. Good greeting. <laughs> <laughs> One more.